Hello, hi everybody. Welcome to Fit and Bendy q and um, Starting a little late today because holiday season, family in town. Had a margarita with lunch, but I am completely ready to do this now. So um, we've got a lot of good questions today and uh, let's get right to it. Um, let us start with Lindley. I am enjoying the festive season. Thank you, Lindley. Um, so back bend definitely looks like it's getting pretty good, but I agree with you. And, and Lindley has sent in some photos of her doing splits and uh, bridge. And um, the splits do still look like your hip flexor is probably the biggest problem because I can see how um, special appearance by our guest guest teacher today, Betty Boop, um, that the back hip is definitely open so that when you're in the splits, it's turning out a lot and it's lifting up and you're kind of collapsing into your back there. So, um, and then I can also see in your bridge, the bridge is supposed to be, you know, uh, like an archway, like a bridge, it's rounded, and yours is a little bit of a tabletop. And looking, um, looking at your photo, I can tell that you're you tend to you look like you have pretty long legs compared to your torso, and in some ways that makes a bridge a little bit more of a difficult position to really get into the hips. But um, definitely stretching your hip flexors is going to be the next big frontier for you to really get deeper into, um, into that position, both the, uh, the splits and the bridges, and to make it more comfortable and more enjoyable as well. So lots of lunges. And when you're doing the lunges, don't worry about sinking deep into the lunge. A lot of times people think about just trying to sink as deep as they can. But instead of doing that, think about really tucking your pelvis and lifting your body up out of your hips nice strong muscles and just trying to get the longest line possible through the front of the hip. So when you sink down, that hip can open up and your back arches and then you're not really stretching the hip anymore. You're kind of skipping the tight part that you really want to get. So try to keep both of your hip bones in one line. So you're going to really push from the attachment point to the hamstring and downstairs, but to really open up the front of that hip and see if that helps. And if you get used to doing that in lunges, then it's going to be much easier to feel it when you're in your splits and when you're in your bridges where there is a lot of other stuff going on as well. So sometimes in the rush to get those splits flat and to get into the bridges, we skip those really tight spots in the hand and the hip flexors that just don't want to open up. Sometimes it's the hamstrings for certain people. For you, it looks like the hip flexors are probably the tight spot. So just don't compromise your form. And I'm not saying that you can never let them open up and sink down to the floor. Some people say you should never ever do that. I say, yeah, you know, if you want to do an open split and get flat on the floor, you know, the dancer split it's called because it creates a longer line with the hip open. Um, then go ahead and do it, but it to really open up your hips the way that you want to have them for nice, beautiful square splits and to have really good back bends, then working on your splits in square is what's going to get you that. Even if you are, if, even if you go to come two feet back up off the ground, you're like almost down with them open. And then as soon as you square them, you come way back up here because of the tightness of those hip flexors. It's worth it. It's worth it to sit in that incredibly frustrating position for a while. And they will open up. They will change over time. Um, and the more strengthening you can do for your hamstring attachment point, the back of the legs and the outside of the hips, the more it will also help to open up those hip flexors. So um, that would be my recommendation. But good work. Good job. Very nice. Congratulations. Um, boo, boo, boo. Sabine. Hey, Sabine. How's it going? Um, so Sabine uh, is having some problems with the balls of the thumbs supporting the body with the hands in front. So I notice that you're doing this kind of crazy hand position like this. Um, so yeah, that <laughs> might be a little hard on your thumbs. Um, if you are going to do be on your fingertips, really try to spread out your fingers and tense your fingers like this so that you're not just pushing so much into weight just into your thumbs, but spreading it out. So instead of turning this way, face your fingers straight forward and really spread out your fingers and think about squeezing your fingertips into the floor. It's kind of like palming a basketball, not that I've ever palmed a basketball my entire life, but what I understand that palming a basketball would be like that you're, you're, you're squeezing it with the whole palm. So the whole hand is engaged and pressing the fingertips in and then support the weight on the fingertips that way rather than being here. Because this this could, I can see how that would make your thumbs angry. Yeah. Um, and in terms of being able to lift your butt off the ground this way, um, it is, I also have short arms compared to my torso. I have kind of long torso and short arms and legs. 
good for some things, not great for this particular movement. So to be able to lift and lift the butt up off the floor, um, it is. It takes a lot of tucking in the pelvis, and I have never really been able to get my butt up off the floor and my legs up in front of me because I have to get such a deep tuck in the pelvis to get my butt up off the floor, um, and my back is so used to going the other direction. So yeah, I mean, for certain body types, that is a really tough move. It works better on like people with long, long gazelle arms um, compared to their torsos. That makes it much easier. That said, the great cheat that you can find is to use a couple blocks. Um, it would be hard in your gymnastics stuff. I know on the balance beam, you're not gonna have a couple blocks, but it's a good way to practice it. You get a couple of yoga blocks or even just a little wooden blocks. They look kind of like the tops of, of handstand canes and put those under your under your hands and use that to lift yourself off. And then that is, it's basically what you ask if there's a way to make your arms longer. I mean, short of some sort of really sort of island of Dr. Moreau scary surgery, I think the only way to do that would be to put some blocks underneath your hands and you can use that to create that extra space. And then the other thing is that if you really do wanna be able to do those movements where you're able to lift your butt up and swing it through off the ground without blocks, then the way to do that would be to work on a lot of pelvic flexion. So that's really tucking the pelvis under. It's a ton of ab strength to be able to curl your body up like a little shrimp and bring the knees up and make your body shorter so that your arms are long enough and really push down with the arms to try to get that butt up in the air. But, you know, it's it's it, that's a challenge. It's a lot of strength to be able to do that when you've got short arms and a long torso. So, um, you know, something to work towards. In the meantime, try the cheat with the blocks. I think you'll be happy with that in the short term. It'll at least let you build strength in that position until you can get that full tuck, that full flexion of the torso to make the torso shorter. Good question. Um, da, da, da. Okay, so Sabine also had a longer question where I could really ramble on about how to design your exercise plan, your bigger exercise plan. So I'm going to save that one to the end, Sabine, so that um, I'm going to come back to it because a couple of people had questions that relate to that. Um, Jirgana, hi Jirgana. I'm glad that you're getting your ankle taken care of. Um, that sounds like a bummer, but you know, sometimes these things happen. And uh, you have a question about mermaid pose and yoga and, and what to work on for that. So for those of you who don't know, there are so many different names for all these. This is mermaid pose. It's when you're gonna bring your, your foot in and this front leg is bent. So this is all quad and hip flexor. I mean, I'm not, my quads aren't super warmed up right now, but um, this is really stretching already and I'm not even that far into it. So all of these muscles through here, down the quad. So to work on that, I would say, and I, looking at your picture, I can tell that probably it's just the tightness in the quadriceps up into the hip. So this quadriceps really run all the way up here and attach up in here. Um, so when we're talking about hip flexors, a lot of times we're also talking about the quadriceps. There, there's one connected related object so um when you're in order to work on that stretch the quads stretch the, um and stretch the hips so lunges are good and then you can also do your lunge with your back foot up against the wall so that would look a little bit like this make sure i'm in frame so the back leg go up against the wall and then tuck the pelvis and sink the hips down so now Usually when you do the lunge with the leg straight and the leg flat on the floor, you're getting primarily in here. But as soon as that leg comes up, I'm sorry, you get all the way through the quad. And the further back you scoot the knee, the closer the knee goes to the wall, the deeper the quad stretch. So um, as long as that doesn't hurt your knee, that's a really good way of working on it. Um, if that does hurt your knee, then you can do the same thing, but lying down bringing the leg back this way. You can lie on your side, bring the leg back. And that's a little bit gentler on the knee. Um, all of these, uh, if you have weak knees, all of these quad stretches can sometimes feel a little cranky in the knee. So if you are doing these, it's important to also incorporate knee strengthening. We've talked about knee strengthening in some of the other Q and A's, um, but to do both of those together. And I think, I think that you had mentioned some, some knee stuff. So be careful on these at first and go slowly. Okay, and make sure that you're doing your knee strengtheners at the same time because the quads are connected there through the knee as well. So if you're stretching those, it can be a little bit hard on the knee joint. Um, 
but the more that you start to open up those quads out. And the other thing would be, you know, strengthen the hamstring. Always if you have some muscle that's really tight for you, you strengthen the opposing muscles. So the opposing muscles to the quads are the hamstrings, and that will, that will help allow these guys to relax a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's a totally attainable goal. I think it's a good goal thing to work towards. Um, just be careful on those knees. Um, things for regaining strength in your ankle. Well, I mean, the classic strengthening for the ankle is releves. So, like in ballet, coming up on your toes. Um, pardon my cozy winter socks. You guys are going to laugh at me, but it's like 50 in L.A. and I am freezing cold, so I'm wearing my winter clothes. Um, all of you who live in actual cold climates, I think will think I'm hilarious, but you get really soft if you live in California for a while, so pardon my socks. Um, so when you're doing your releves, you want to stand so that your toes are touching and your heels are touching, so your feet are really close together, and then you want to lift your ankle bones slightly apart. See if you can see that. that now I'll take off my fuzzy socks. It's hard to see, isn't it? Hard to see through the fuzzy socks. So what I'm looking for is correct alignment. The way you can tell the alignment is correct is that the bottom, when the bottoms of your feet are touching, there's no space between the knuckles below my big toes. There's no space between my heels, but then my ankle bones are slightly lifted up and away. And if you look down at your feet, you should see a nice straight line from right between your your second toe and your third toe all the way up your shin bone to your knee. And from here, now it's a little harder when I'm on a squishy mat, from here I'm going to raise up onto the balls of my feet. Now the temptation here is to allow those ankles to bow out to the side. But you want to keep the heels touching and the ankle bones slightly apart the entire time. Come up as high as you can and then slowly back down, up and down. Try doing 20 of those. If 20 seems like a lot, start with 10 and gradually build up to 20, 30 of those at a time. And um, that's just, you know, very basic, very good um, ankle strengthener. But keeping that clean alignment, do it in front of a mirror so you can see what your ankles are doing. Notice if they want to bow in or out, what they want to do if the feet want to turn. Notice where your weight is. You want your eight weight pretty evenly distributed as you come up into the balls of your feet. If it's too far to the outside, too far to the inside, adjust it so it's spread over the front of the foot. No gripping with your toes. All good things to think about, and um, you can try to do it with balance. But at the beginning, just go ahead and put a hand on the wall or on the back of a chair because ju you just want to work on getting that technique. And doing a lot of those will help prevent future ankle problems as well. Um, and there are a ton more, but that's just a good place to start. Who is next? Tamara. Tamara? Tamara. Tamara. Um, I have no idea, but whichever way. Um, so, okay, so Tamara Tamara is feeling her hamstring stretches right up at the hamstring connector point, so that's right up here instead of in the belly of the hamstring down here. Is that normal? Um, it's a thing. That's a thing that you can feel. Um, the muscle extends all the way up there, so it's not abnormal to feel a stretch all the way up there. Um, it's true that a lot of people sprain or strain that that um, that area of the hamstring, right where it connects. Um, so it's important to do strengthening exercises for that area as well as stretches. But you do want to have flexibility there, and in fact, um, and all of the hamstring stretches, um, I really encourage people to stick their butts out a little bit, and that really helps you get the full hamstring instead of just the belly of the hamstring. Because I have worked with people in the past with crazy flexibility down here, but a lot of tightness right up at the top, and um, that can that can create problems. That kind of imbalance, so not necessarily a bad thing. That maybe you work through some tightness lower down in the leg, and now you're getting to the tightness at the top of the leg. Just be sure to not push it too quickly, because that tends to be an area that's really weak on most of it. We're always on most of us. We're always sitting on it, and um, we don't work it a lot. So try to do some hamstring strengthening. Um, the series on bendy body I really like. Also, um, just anything where you're kind of lifting and extending the leg out behind you. Um, really focusing on keeping the pelvis tucked because as soon as you arch your back, then you're just using your back instead of your of your hamstring connection. But trying to build up that strength. Also, um, another good one is lying on your back and doing these little butt lifts. 
Imagine I'm lying all the way down. I just don't want to be off camera. Um, little butt lifts like this. I'm trying to feel the strength here. So if you combine those strengthening exercises with the stretches, sort of alternating them and working them together, then um, that will help to, it, it, that's a really good prevention for, for hamstring pulls, which as you correctly stated are very common. So yeah, that sounds good. Um, can I talk about regression? What, how to keep motivated during periods of regression? And that there are definitely periods of regression. Yes, there are periods where like, you're like making great progress, you're feeling really good, and then maybe something happens in your life, um, you're tired, you're overworked, you're not eating well, you get stressed out. Um, for women, definitely the monthly cycle plays into this so much. Um, and then you just feel like crap when you go to train and you feel like the things that you could do last week or even yesterday, today, just you just can't do them. And um, so some things to think about in terms of that is that it happens to everyone, everyone. Every single, I mean, like the best service performers I've worked with have their days where they're just like, ah, everything feels like crap. And they lie on the floor and like have temper tantrums. So <laughs> everybody has that. It is normal because your body goes through phases. You're, it goes through cycles where you have more energy and less energy. You can't be on a constant upward cycle. It's, it's just impossible. It's always going to go through waves. And so the waves kind of go like this. You're gradually improving, but they're always going to be the downs as well as the ups. And um, it is important to not just give up on those days. The, the, the desire often is to lay on the floor and have a tenter, tenter, temper tantrum or go home and eat ice cream, whatever it is that you do to make yourself feel better. Um, but the problem with that is that, that sort of, it, it takes you away from working towards your goal. And just because you can't do everything that you could do yesterday doesn't mean that you're not doing valuable work on that day. So um, I, in my last blog post, I talked about keeping a training journal and um, how important that is. And you'll notice in your training journal, if you really start to keep track, you can go back and look and you can see those waves really clearly. Like, I'm great, not so great, great, not so great, but with the gradual improvement. And for myself, like I also mentioned that in, the, in my journal where I write everything down, on those particularly bad days, sometimes I'll give myself a little gold star. It's very kindergarten, but it totally works to just remind myself, I call them the spirit days. I'm just, I'm there in spirit. My body might not be doing it, but I'm there in spirit and I just do the best I can. And maybe I'll leave out some of my most difficult stuff that I know is just gonna destroy me. Um, but I try to go through my full workout. Maybe I don't do as many things. Um, but that way my body knows that even on bad days, it can still, I can still do it. I can still get through. And especially if you, uh, for all you performers out there, you know, like you can't. You, just because you're having an off day, you can't be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to make it to the show tonight. You have to go anyway. So training your body and, and you know, for competitions, whatever it is that you do in your life, some days you're going to, you're going to like have to go or really want to go do something and it might be an off day. So you have to train your body that like, okay, today's not going to be our most stellar day, but we're going to go and we're going to do our best. And the more that you train uh, no matter what it is that you feel like that day, within reason, you know, um, if you're really sick, that's different. But if it's just an off day, you can teach your body that it's okay. It's okay. You can teach your brain that it's okay, that you don't have to be performing at the very top level all the time to be good. That's not what being good is. Being good is being consistent and continuing to work forward. And just know that you're not alone. It happens to everybody. It's it's part of the training process. It is part of your process. If you accept it as part of your process, then you don't have to get upset about it. You don't have to fight it. Um, you also, two blog posts ago, I, I wrote a whole thing about wait, the ways that I use to stay positive. It's 10, 10 things that I try to think of to stay positive in training because it can get discouraging sometimes. Let's face it, you know, we're trying to do all these crazy things. And there are a lot of ways that you can, you can get down and get discouraged. Someone's making more progress than you are. Someone else is better than you are. Um, or you could do this yesterday and you can't today, or why is this taking so long? So there are, those, all of those are normal things to feel. It's not that you shouldn't feel them. Of course you're going to feel them, but then you have to go back and, and, you know, find ways to encourage yourself and keep going. And, and a big part of that, I think, is just to know that everybody, 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 everybody goes through it and it's okay.
So I hope that helps. I hope that helps as a way of thinking about it. Um, not always at our best. Mm, too true. All right, Melanie, Melanie Irene. Um, uh, also wants to know about routines. How do you structure a routine? You know what, Melanie? I am. I'm going to come back to that as well. Um, I'm going to answer that all in one one thing at the very end. Um, but thank you. The excellent question, Flora. Oh, Flora, you you got some stumpers for me. Um, when you're stretching, you're feeling a stretch pain behind the knees and ankles, and sometimes feeling that when you're walking as well, and it's a neuromuscular pain. So um, I'm assuming by neuromuscular, you're meaning like a nerve pain, like a tingly, nervy pain. Um, generally in stretching, when you're feeling a nerve pain, that is a sign that something isn't quite right. So I'm hesitant to really get too into this. I don't really know. I'll be honest with you. I don't really know what's going on, why you're having that pain. I, I, I'd have to work with you a lot more. And even then, like I've said many times, I'm not a doctor. So I, I could guess, but I'm hesitant to even guess. But my, the one thing that I will say is if you're having nerve pain, uh, especially if you're having it after you're done stretching, those are two things. Nerve pain and pain after you're done stretching that feels nervy are two signs that something's not quite right. So I would I would advise seeing someone about it, um, especially if it's if it's getting worse, it's not getting better, and it's chronic, it's ongoing. Um, that those are not good signs. So you might have overdone something. I'm not sure. You might um, you might also have like some like fascia that's pinching nerves back there. I don't know. There are plenty of possibilities of what it could be, but definitely I would recommend getting that checked out. Okay. Um, and uh, your second question, um, okay, this one also, I just don't know, no, I don't know. Uh, sometimes after my stretching, you, I feel a heartbeat in my left hip. Ah, mm, I don't know. I mean, okay, here's, here is a hypothetical situation. That it could be a muscle spasm where it's going like this, don't, 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 like the muscle inside the hip is doing that. Um, sometimes that can happen if the muscle is like really working hard and doing something new, it can start to spasm afterwards. Um, my best advice would be drink a ton of water. Um, because sometimes those kinds of weird spasming thing happen when you're dehydrated. So if you drink a ton of water and it's still happening, it could be a nutritional thing. It could be, um, your body's freaking out. Um, if you are newer to stretching and you just started doing all these routines and you're having like this nerve pain and this weird spasmy thing in your hip, it could be maybe you're pushing yourself a little bit too hard. I don't know. Um, but that's something to think about. And also think about your hydration and your nutrition and your sleep because if all of those, if you're pushing your body really hard and then you're not taking care of it and feeding it and resting it and giving it everything else it needs, um, then sometimes weird stuff like that can start happening. But I don't know. Sorry. I, I don't want to make something up and be wrong. So. <laughs> um, for Clara. Clara? Clara. Let's call the whole thing off. Um, glad you liked the video. That makes me very happy. Um, bending or hinging from the hips. I always find I have a rounded back and I want to work on a flat back and bending more from the hips. And Clara, Clara, Carla. Carla. Sorry, did I mention the margarita with lunch? Carla from Canada. Um, so the picture, she's in straddle and bending forward and has a very rounded spine here and wants to have more extension through the back going forward. So this is a pretty common problem and it has to do with tightness in the lower back and the outside of the hips usually. So um, part of what you can do is uh, start to work on actively trying to extend through the back. So for instance, when you're in your, your straddle stretch, um, your back is rounded here. Fold up a blanket and put it underneath your butt and that will give you a little bit of elevation so your feet are lower than your hips. It sometimes helps. And then actively just work on sitting up straight. Use your muscles, feel these muscles in your torso working to lift you up. Um, if you have a friendly friend who wants to help you, they can also put their hands um, or their, their back against your back and just help to lift you up out of your hips and just try to hold it there. If they hold you like that for, let's say, 30 to 60 seconds and let go and you try to hold it by yourself and they can lift you again, do that a few times, to start to get that length, that lifting out of the hips. 
Also, um, stretches for external rotation. So um, I'm guessing that this is probably your position here with uh, like a butterfly stretch. Again, put that blanket underneath your butt and you can grab a hold of your ankles and just work on sitting up and pushing your knees down. So you're actively trying to push the knees down even if they're up here. Even if this is where you are, you're trying to push your knees down and you're pulling your ankles to try to lift your body up. So this is a stretch. Uh, uh, you, you are working on stretching, but even more than stretching, a lot of the solution to this rounded back is strengthening. Because what happens is those muscles get so tight. You're so curled up in here, so you're so tight. Um, and you need to strengthen the muscles in your core to lift your body up to try to get more length in that lower back. Um, the last thing that's really good is, is rotation and lateral flexion. So um, doing twisty movements here, you can even just do it sitting with your feet over the edge, just like I am now, and twisting your body as much as you can, trying to sit up tall and twist, 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 doing it in both directions, a couple of repetitions each side, and that twisting will again start to loosen up. Imagine that you have like a big knot of muscle there in the lower back. And so you're going to try to squeeze it and lift it and lengthen it, create space in it, and then you're going to twist it and stretch it. And then just like when you have a tight knot of yarn, if you loosen it up a little bit, it makes it easier to unravel. So same thing. And then going over to the side, reaching up with the arms, going sideways this direction. All of that movement, doing some movement through there, moving it around, will start to loosen it up a little bit. So strengthening little bit of stretching, side bending, twisting. See if that helps, see how that goes. But just when you're, when you're in that position, do try putting the, the uh, folded up blanket or pillow, something underneath your butt, um, and that will just help give you a little bit of extra boost there. Um, dee -dee -dee, Carla. Justine, hi Justine. Um, I am sorry that you're feeling very discouraged, Justine. Um, as I may have said, that happens to the best of us. Um, Justine uh, was having a lot of lower back pain and went to the doctor and the doctor said that um, she had, is hyperlordotic, has a large lordotic curve. So that the uh, lordotic curve, I also have that. Um, and that's when you have that exaggerated arch in the lower back. Um, and it can be either something that you're born with or something that you develop through postural habits. But generally, by the time you get to be an adult, if you've had that for your whole life, it can be very difficult to start to um, work with it. And um, I, a lot of people who um, start training flexibility and have that lordotic curve, uh, they get better in the back flexibility very quickly because that, that curve lends itself to backbending, but then have the same problem that you're having, Justine, and I had this as well, where because your back just kind of folds in that one spot, it's easy to collapse into the spine, and it's sort of like a pipe cleaner that you just keep bending in one space over and over and over again after a while it starts to wear out, and you can start to get bad pain, even long-term injury from doing that. So taking a break from backbending, you're doing the right thing, and what you have to do is strengthen, 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 strengthen. You've got to strengthen your lower abs, and you've got to learn how to do a back bend without collapsing into that part of your back. And um, so a lot of that is about not allowing your butt to stick out when you're going over backwards. And at first, it's going to feel really difficult because what you've got to do is bring your hips to a neutral position, which for someone with who's hyperlordotic, just doing that can feel really, really difficult. And I had to work on it for quite some time because I was constantly here. So bring your hips into this position, and then when you're going over into your back bend, instead of collapsing here, now you see my center of gravity. Right now, my center of gravity is right in my lower back, so my entire upper body weight is sitting into my spine, and it's taking my vertebrae, and it's going <laughs> not so cool. So instead of that, what you want to feel is this lifting. So I'm engaging through the hamstring attachment, the downstairs, but I'm engaging through the abs. I'm using all these muscles to support my back. Now my center of gravity is further forward. It's in my abdominal muscles, which are strong and are designed to support my back. But mostly people who are hyperlordotic, who have that exaggerated curve, have really weak lower abdominal muscles because of that posture, tend to have weak hips. And I, say, I see that you're strengthening your hip flexors so I just want to clarify, you don't want to be working on strength for, for your superficial hip flexors. So like the quad attachment point, these guys here are probably super tight on you. 
And those are not what you want to be strengthening. You want to be strengthening the deep hip flexors, the psoas, the iliopsoas. So I just want to make sure that that's what you're doing, not the superficial ones, but the deep ones. Also, the lower abdominal muscles, the pelvic floor, and the hip extensors or the hamstrings, especially the upper hamstrings. Strengthening all of those and learning how to use those as you backbend will really help. But I promise you that this can get better because I have the same problem and a lot of people who have come to work with me have the same problem. It's a very common problem with hyperlordotic people who start training backbends to start to get this extreme back pain. And you do have to kind of take a little step back and retrain your body, retrain the way that you do your back bends. But it's very possible. It's very possible. And um, then you can have that flexibility and use it, but use it without collapsing into it. Use it in a way that's healthy for your back in the long term instead of damaging. So don't get discouraged. I promise there, is, there are definitely solutions to your problem, and it doesn't mean that you have to stop training altogether. Okay? Um, do, do, do. Tamara, Tamara, but a different Tamara, Tamara. Is one of you Tamara, the other one Tamara? I don't know. Well, I'll stop now. Um, okay. Um, Tamara, Tamara, got bendy body. Um, question about sequencing. How often would you use it? Um, every day, every other day. If you don't have a full hour to go through the whole video, would it be a bad idea to break it up? Do half and half? Um, well, I generally say like it's better to do the whole DVD, but hey, we've all got busy lives. So with Bendy Body in particular, if that's that's actually a DVD where you could kind of break it up a little bit. Um, the one thing I will say is that if you are going to do the back bending section at the end, definitely stretch your hip flexors first. It's really important to stretch your hip flexors before you do a back bend. Um, otherwise, you do t tend to get that crunching in the lower back. The lengthening of the hip flexors is an extremely important part of feeling your back bend. So you can break it up into sections, but um, just make sure that those two, if you're going to do back bends, you also do the, the lunges. Um, with Get Bent, the other DVD, that one is harder to break up and do separately. I know some people like to do legs one day and back and shoulders and back the other day. The problem with that, again, is that that lunge sequence is so important to do before you back bend. Um, so if you are going to break up either of the DVDs, just make sure that those two things happen. Even if you are focusing primarily on back and shoulders one day, just throw in those lunges at the beginning. Do some extra extra lengthening for, for the front of the hips and the quads before going into a back bending section. Um, in terms of frequency, you know, it, and, and that, okay, now is, this is the perfect segue into this discussion about designing your workout plan. Um, it is, it's very individual. Um, I would really encourage you guys to look at my last blog post about the exercise journal because I kind of address this in that blog post. Um, but basically what I recommend doing is um, you set a workout that feels a doable it will fit into your schedule um you don't want to set something that's super ambitious and and then you know you, you burn out or you just don't have time to do it so you want to set something you can actually achieve and that where the amount of exercise that you're doing is hard for you but not miserably impossible so um if you haven't been exercising for a really long time and you're just starting to do this then I would say three days a week is going to be fine at the beginning. And maybe you, you work out for an hour, three days a week. And you set, you know, maybe you do um, the full DVD twice a week, and then you have a day that you do half and another day that you do half. And um, if you do that and afterwards you're like you're tired, you're a little bit sore, but you're not like <sighs> exhausted, falling down on the floor, can't stand up out of bed the next day. That's kind of where you want to be. And then you do that for two to four weeks, and you keep track as you're doing that of how your body is responding to that particular workout. Then you take stock and you say, okay, you know what, this has gotten pretty easy. I feel like I need more. Maybe I'm gonna do the full DVD now three times a week, or maybe I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna do this section extra because I feel like you know my hamstrings really need extra work, so I'm gonna repeat that section to really start to get into that. And then you see how your body responds to that. And gradually, tailor and build your workout based on a 
how much energy and time you have, and B, what goals you want to achieve. And um, I really like working in some cross training. Um, I, I don't want to just stretch. Um, the way that my body works, I do better if I stretch and strengthen. So most of my workouts, I'm alternating stretch, strengthen, stretch, strengthen. And then I try to throw in some cardio, cross training, um, you know, just to keep, keep the tub down. Um, so I, I find for, for me, for my body, changing up the workouts and doing a lot of different things works best for me. But I know other people who are very focused and, and have, you know, just a few things they do all the time that seems to work for their bodies. So you need to, you need to get to know your body. Different bodies respond differently to things. Another thing to think about is that um, just because you want to increase your flexibility doesn't mean that you don't need to do strengthening as well. Um, a lot of times we think muscles are tight, so we just need to stretch and stretch and stretch them. But sometimes muscles are tight because they are weak. When a muscle is weak, it gets panicky, it gets scared, and it clamps up. And that's actually a, a lot of what happens with people's lower backs. When the lower back gets really tight like that, if your lower back and your core muscles are very weak, then your little postural muscles are doing so much extra work, and they just ah, 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 they get really angry. It happens with the shoulders, too. So starting to strengthen those muscles, starting to engage them, use the muscles, will actually help you when you're stretching them. So doing both the strengthening and the stretching together. Um, and I realize I'm not giving you guys a really specific, you like you do this, 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 and this sort of response, but what I would really encourage you to do is just get to know yourself. And the journal is great for that. And um, as you design your workouts, you pay attention, you write down how you feel afterwards. If you can't get out of bed the next day because you're that sore, then you're pushing too hard. It's, it's not your best results aren't going to come when you just destroy yourself at every workout. It's going to make workout less fun. It's going to make you more prone to injury. And it's, it's exhausting. It's not sustainable. Um, I don't think that's going to give you the results that you want. Um, what I think works better is slow incremental increase in, in the difficulty of what you're doing as your body adjusts. Your body will always adjust to the demands that you give it. But if you give it too much demand too quickly, it will just, it'll break down. That's when you'll start to have problems. So small increases, you can't be too impatient with these workouts you designed for yourself. You're not going from zero to Cirque du Soleil in a couple months. It's just not possible. So be realistic. You know, if your goal is just to touch your toes, work on touching your toes. Don't work on, you know, going over backwards and doing catch ankles. Go with what, what, what is in front of you. And when you reach that goal, give yourself that gold star in your training journal and set a new goal. Set some new goals. When something that used to be difficult for you becomes easy, make it a little bit more difficult. Start to tailor the workout in that direction. Um, in terms of the balance between different kinds of exercise um, and cross-training, which I think uh, that was a question that you had, Tamara. I was like, um, no, it wasn't Tamara. Melanie, Melanie had um, the periodization um, where you go back and forth between different kinds of, of routines. I personally like that for my body. So I have basically three different routines that I rotate through um, that all are pretty different and give me different kinds of, of strength and stretching and active flexibility, passive flexibility. Um, and I find that my body responds best to that. And I've really worked on tailoring those routines um, over time to give me what works best for me. Um, I know that if I do too many handstands, then my shoulders get really tight and cranky and they lose flexibility. So if I have to alternate handstands with shoulder flexibility and shoulder stretching, um, I know that if I do too much cardio and I'm jumping around too much, it makes my hips tight. So I have to constantly rotate through that. So you'll get to know your body too and, and those, um, those types of, of problems. And then there are some things that you know you just need to do every day. You know, if you have if you have those those certain things like like for Jagana for your ankles, you know you need to do ankle stabilization every day. You need to do those releves every day. For you, that would be an important thing to put in every single workout. So, you know, get to know those things, those those chronic problems that you know that you need to take care of through really consistent work. Maybe in six months or a year you won't need to do that every day, but for now you know you do. So I hope that answers the questions. Um, I know it's a little bit vague, 
but um, it really requires you to, to get to know yourself and to think, and that's really, that's the gift of this. That's the gift of this strange, crazy journey of, of, of fitness is you get to know yourself and your body so much better through doing this. It's not all about like one size fits all. It's about who you are as a person, your goals and your body. So I have talked enough for today and um, thank you everybody for listening. I look forward to um, in the new year uh, working with you guys um, on whatever it is that you go on to after the splits challenge. So um, I hope you all keep in touch and have a wonderful New Year's Eve. All right. This is Christina Nakaya signing out, wishing you many happy bendings in the new year. Take care.